Welcome to Kingdom Life University, a division of Action Evangelism, preparing you to serve the Lord of the Harvest. Here is your teacher, Evangelist Jerry Brandt. Yes, well, I'm on Ephesians chapter 3 today. We've been going through the book of Ephesians a chapter at a time each day. Uh, We've been studying about the wonderful blessings that are ours. I like Ephesians chapter 1 because that's really the theme for the entire book. Blessed be the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. Do you realize that in Jesus Christ you have everything you need? Everything that pertains to life and godliness is yours now, not some future time, now. God has made every provision for you and me to walk in victory, to walk in joy, to walk in peace, to walk in the blessings of the kingdom of God, which are righteousness, right standing with God and with men, righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And so today we're going to be looking at another aspect of this kingdom. It's a wonderful thing when you really realize it. Uh, Ephesians chapter 3, for this cause, Paul said, the prisoner of Jesus Christ. You see, you can put people in prison, but he said, really, man didn't put me in prison. Uh, Jesus Christ allowed me to be here for his divine purposes. And we know in prison he wrote, he wrote these books, uh, these four epistles, Galatians, Ephesians, uh, Philippians, and and uh, Colossians, wonderful books, all written from prison. You see, it's not your circumstances that determine who you are. It's it's uh, you you determine who you are, man. You decide uh, who you're going to be. It's not it's not from the outside. It's from the inside. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're in a prison. Doesn't matter where you are or what you're doing. Uh, if Jesus Christ is your Lord, you're a prisoner of Jesus, not not of the of the prisoners, not of the prison guards. And so he said, I'm a prisoner for Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles. If you heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given to me to you word. It's really interesting to me, you see, uh, Paul was sent, first of all, uh, he was really the, the mystery given to Paul, the mystery of the gospel of grace was given to him for the Gentiles. God had given opportunity to the Jews to receive the gospel. Uh, we're going to look at that. But Paul said, in, in, uh, he said, uh, depart from me and I will send you far from here to the Gentiles. And they listened to him until this word came. And then they raised their voices and said, away with such a fellow from the earth, for he is not fit to live. You see, the Jewish council that Paul was in front of in the book of Acts, when he says, God has sent me here uh, for the Gentiles, they didn't like that message. Now, let's look at the Jewish background here. You see, the Jews had an opportunity under John the Baptist to receive the gospel. In those days, it says in Matthew 3, 1 through 3, in those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is the one that was spoken of the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make straight his path. So God, through John the Baptist, was given a message primarily to the Jews. They had the opportunity to prepare the way for the Lord. But they rejected John, threw him into prison. He was beheaded in prison by, uh, by the king of the day there in Jerusalem. <laughs> so then we realize uh, that Jesus also offered the kingdom to the Jewish people in Matthew 4, verses 12 through 17. Now when Jesus heard that John had been put into prison, he departed into Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is by the sea, the reasons of Zebedon and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea to beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and upon who, who has sat in that region in the shadows of death, the light has dawned. From that day, Jesus began to preach and say to Israel, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But did the Jewish nation receive Jesus? No, they didn't. They rejected him as king. And so we find God finally makes a final attempt in the book of Acts, chapter 7, through the apostles and through Stephen. This was kind of the last 
This was the last time that God really offered this kingdom to Israel. Here it is. And when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, that is Israel, and they gnashed on him with their teeth, that is on Stephen. And he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, Look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran at him with one accord. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him, and the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of young man named Saul. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God, saying, The Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And then he, was, he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge this sin to them. And when he said this, he fell asleep. And so uh, Stephen was kind of the final straw. This was God's last call and plea to the Je Jewish people. But we notice that the robe of Stephen was laid at the feet of Saul. Saul had been given a charge by the high priest to go out and, and to persecute the Christians and destroy the church uh, in the early t days. And so here we find uh, the gospel had been offered, but Paul had been raised up. You see, uh, 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 Acts chapter 9 was a conversion version of Saul. And so the last opportunity that God gave Israel was found in the book of Acts. And it, Paul was called here on the road to Damascus. God touched him, brought him to Christ. God said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, who is this? And he said, this is the Lord Jesus. And of course, he was blind for a number of days and he, he received his sight later. But he, not only did he receive his physical sight, but his eyes was, were open to the true gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we realize that Paul had an explanation of his ministry here in Ephesians chapter 3. This chapter, uh, uh, the first chapter of Ephesians uh, we looked at, uh, you know, talked about the wealth we have in Christ. And now God's moving into a more practical section, the walk we have in Christ. We learn about the wealth, men, the blessings that we have through the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in chapter 1. And we have been made a temple in chapter 2. But now he goes from the wealth we have in Christ to the walk we have in Christ. But first Paul pauses to pray. And he begins his prayer in verse 1, but he doesn't continue it until uh, he has a parenthesis here in the early part of this chapter. He picks the prayer back up in verse 13. But there's a long parenthesis where Paul explains his ministry. It's important because Paul was a transition apostle between the Jews and the Gentiles. And so Paul had been arrested in Jerusalem and was making his defense to his people when he talked about this here in Ephesians chapter 3. And so Paul explains that God had given him a special revelation and special dispensation or stewardship of the gospel. He called it the mystery of Christ. And the reason it was a mystery is because God kept it unnoticed. He kept it hidden until Paul received his revelation, so Satan could not hinder the purpose of God. God will oftentimes allow things to be hidden so the enemy cannot take a hold of it and destroy it before it's time. And so we realize that Paul's ministry was to the Gentiles, and it was a ministry of grace. And the, and the truth was that we have been made one body in Christ, Jew and Gentile, called the mystery of the church. What a great mystery this is. He talks about it in Colossians chapter 1, verses 26 and 27 as well. The mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Boy, do the Jews have a hard time receiving this message. Peter rejected it until God gave him the vision three times. God said, God lowered a sheet with all these unclean animals on it. And Paul, Peter said, I can't eat of these animals in this vision. And God said, don't call anything unclean that I've made clean. And, and then so Paul in Cornelius' home, or Peter in Cornelius' home, later witnessed the power of the Holy Spirit falling on the Gentiles. And so Paul was given the message of the mystery you see, Paul was used to reveal this mystery of the church. Uh, by the way, the church is used to reveal this mystery to the angels. I love this section. Here it is. How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery which I wrote before, 
whereby you read and you may understand the knowledge of the mystery of Christ, which in other, other ages was not known to the sons of men as are now revealed through his holy apostles and prophets, that the Gentiles be fellow heirs and the, of the same body, partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Wherefore, I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effectual working of his power. I love it. And we have a fellowship with this mystery, verse 9, to make known to men to see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world has been hidden God who created all things in Jesus Christ to the intent now that unto principalities and powers in heavenly places might be made known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. Think of this. As you and I live out this great salvation, we are literally manifesting to the angelic hosts in the heavenlies the mystery of God's program for the church. It's awesome when you think about it. According to his eternal purpose, it says in verse 11, which he purposed in Christ. (laughs) I love it. In whom we have boldness and access and confidence by faith in him. So he says, don't faint at, your, faint at your tribulations, which is your glory. For this cause I bow my knee to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to his riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the depth and the height, and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge and be filled with the fullness of God. What is the fullness of God? To be filled with the fullness of God is to be filled with the love of God. He calls it unsearchable riches, untraceable riches. You cannot trace them back in the Old Testament. There's nothing in the Old Testament that really teaches us about this. This came to Paul as a revelation in the desert as he was set apart by God. God God gave him this mystery, and the mystery came as revelation to Paul's mind and heart. God began to show him his divine purpose for this age, and that is that a church would be raised up glorious and powerful and full of the Holy Spirit and full of the fullness of God, full of the love of God, that we can comprehend. You see, that's our problem. We simply cannot comprehend his love. Man, we just simply cannot believe that he loved us so much that he would do all of this for us by grace. We think somehow we've got to earn this thing. There's something we've got to do. Certainly we can add to the work of Jesus Christ somehow. But let me tell you, my friend, it's all been done. It's been done. And so God has fulfilled his purpose in Jesus Christ. And Satan cannot stop this plan of God. In fact, when Satan finally figured things out, he said, I'm going to kill this man named Jesus. And so he moved upon the the, the hosts uh, of the Jewish people to cry out, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. And all he did was seal his own doom. And so we know the message is strong. It's powerful for this age. Why waste our time on any other message? The message is Jesus Christ and him crucified and him manifest in the church today. Aren't you glad to be part of this thing called the church? What is the church? Well, you say, I go to a church. No, no, you go to a uh, a particular fellowship. The church is all believers. I've traveled around the world in missions, and I want to tell you the church is everywhere I go. I meet the church of Jesus Christ, victorious, powerful, reigning in Christ. That's what the church is really all about. Now we get into this intercession. I read a little bit about it. Uh, Paul's talking about the fact that, well, let's look at it. There are really two prayers in Ephesians, and they complement each other. The first prayer uh, we read in chapter 1 was for enlightenment. The second is for enablement. You see, Paul wants to learn uh, to, to teach them what they have then to live, or to learn what they have, then to live what they have, what they've learned. we got to not only learn it, we got to live it. He prays for God's family in heaven and earth. <laughs> That's where God's family is. It's both in heaven and earth. There's some up there and some down here. None, no one under the earth, however. <laughs> Sorry, they're Catholics. Uh, nobody's under the earth here. God's family is in heaven and earth. He prays that the inner man might know spiritual strength. How carelessly we Christians treat the inner man. 
The Holy Spirit empowers us from within through the word of God in prayer. Paul points out that as, as we pray, God's spirit goes to work in us, in us. I like 1 Thessalonians 2, 13. For this reason, we also thank God without ceasing, because when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcome it not as the word of man, but it, as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectually works in you who believe. Can you believe the word of God? When you get the word of God inside of you, it begins to work inside of the inner man, strengthening the inner man. How are you going to be strong in a time of difficult economy, coming tribulations upon the earth? How are you going to be strong in the time of, of great tribulation? How are you going to be strong in the time of sickness and, and, and issues in your life? You're going to be strong by the inner man. It's the inner man that becomes strengthened by the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's really what Paul is talking about. He said that Christ needs to feel at home in our hearts. And he does when there's faith and love. He says, rooted, rooted in Christ Jesus, rooted and build up in him in verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love. You see, what is love? Love is trust. When you understand God's love and you can trust God's love and he can trust you with his love, I want to tell you, you get such a strength in the inner man that nothing's going to shake you. Nothing that comes down the pike. You say, God loves me. I don't care what circumstances what senses might be around me. I know that I know that I know that I love, I have the love of God dwelling in me by faith. Nothing's going to shake you. Love is the most powerful thing on earth. Now abide a faith, hope, and love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. Why? Here's why. You know that faith is temporal? It's just for this earth. We don't need faith in heaven. We're going to walk by sight. What about hope? Well, we don't need hope in heaven. God, when you see Jesus, that's the end of all hope. But what about love? You see, in 1 Corinthians, it says, Now by the faith, hope, and love these three, but the greatest of these is love. The reason that love is the greatest is it's eternal. It's enduring. Love is not something God does. It's something he is. God is love. God can do nothing but love. Don't blame God for the bad things in your life. Every good gift and every perfect gift comes from above, from the Father of lights, with whom there's no ver variableness nor shadow of turning. Don't say that, oh, God did this to me when it's a bad, evil thing. Satan did it to you. He's a destroyer. He's a deceiver. He's the one that is trying to take you out. He's a murderer from the beginning. And he's a liar. It's Satan who does these things. And, of course, he wants to convince you that it's God. It's not God. God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. So don't blame God for the things that the devil does. God has good things for you. God is love. And Paul said, I want your eyes to be open that you may comprehend what the glory of his love is really all about. Awesome. That you may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ. <laughs> you know, it's a growing thing. Trust me, it's a growing thing. It's not something that happens right away. We can comprehend it really kind of from a distance. But as you grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, you grow in the knowledge of his love. His love is totally awesome, powerful. And what's going to happen once you comprehend it? You, what does it mean to comprehend? It means to apprehend, to lay hold of it. Paul has already prayed that they may understand that. Now he prays that they might lay a hold of it, that they may lay their hands on these wonderful blessings for themselves. It's by faith that we lay our hands on these wonderful blessings, God's promises. Paul especially wants him to lay hold of God's immeasurable love, a love that fills all things. Far too many Christians think of God as angry, as a judge, as a stern master, instead of a loving father. How many of us just want a loving father that we can just go to and he can put his arms around us? And I'll tell you what, that's the kind of father we have in heaven. And verse 19 says, if we have that, then we, may, we will be filled with all the fullness of God. That's why I like my friend uh, Socrates so much. He has a great amount of love. Somebody the other day says, you know what? One thing about Socrates, he's full of the love of God. And he is. 
And when you're full of the love of God, you're full of God's fullness. Wow. Is this awesome or what? Why live like paupers when God has given us his fullness? Why live an empty life of disappointing and dangerous attitudes? If the Spirit of God does not fill us, then I'll tell you what's going to fill us. The spirit of disobedience. We read about that back at Ephesians 2, verse 2, where in times past, you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. So if we're not filled with the fullness of God's love and the fullness of God's presence, then we get filled with some, some other spirit. <laughs> Talked about there at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2. You see, it's God's love in us that makes us effective. Others will feel it. They'll see it. They'll know it. And then Paul finishes with a wonderful benediction here in verses 20 on, I love it. He said, um, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Oh, I'm back there in chapter 3, all right. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. Now, I want you to say that with me. Would you please? If you're listening to the radio right now, say it with me right now. God is able, say it, God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can ask or think. You say, Jerry, is that for real? Yes, it's for real. But the last part of the verse is the key. According to the power that works in us, it is not us bringing it about because we want to. It's letting the power of Christ live in us. It's claiming the victory of the cross. It's claiming the power of the resurrection. It's claiming the presence of the Holy Spirit. It's living under the anointing of God that destroys every yoke off of our life. You see, it's the exceedingly abundantly above that God wants to do by the working of his power that works in us, not our power. Let go and let God. You say, how do I do that, Jerry? Just receive it by faith. Confess it with your mouth. Say, Jesus, I cannot do this. I cannot live this victorious life. I cannot live in the exceedingly abundantly above. I've tried it. I've tried it myself, and it doesn't work. It's not going to work with you. It's going to work with Jesus. And then verse 21, Unto him be glory in the church throughout all ages, world without end. There it is. Glory in the church. Glory in the church throughout all ages because what? God did it. Not us. It's not God saying, you got to do this thing and make it work. It's God saying, let me do it through you and in you and for you by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let go and let God. That is the key. Well, we've had a great time today, and I just say, God bless you. We've been going through the book of Ephesians. <laughs> Tomorrow, we're going to be looking at a wonderful work. Uh, and a wonderful walk, I should say, uh, gets into some real practical steps in our life, how to make this thing work in our family and our marriage and, you know, fighting this battle on a daily basis. And we're going to be walking in unity tomorrow. That's one of our points. And uh, unity, there's power in agreement. We looked at that back in our school of evangelism. And we're going to be walking in purity. Uh, it's, it's a great walk. And we're going to be talking about that walk uh, later. And so just get ready. God wants to fill us up with all his fullness, all his blessing, all his presence. Hallelujah.